So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, bienvenue. Uh, welcome to our session on uh, transportation and logistics. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, this session didn't exist as this uh, excellent event was being planned, but by popular demand, it is here for you now. Um, so I just want to thank our guests from CNNCP uh, for joining us and uh, to Pierre from Transport Robert for uh, joining us today <clears throat> to talk a little bit about the current situation out there uh, in relation to the supply chain. Um, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the good news is that business is good in transportation. Uh, the bad news is maybe it's a little bit too good uh, right now uh, to handle as well as we'd like to handle it. So our attention here today is to just um, explore a little bit about where we're at and uh, perhaps uh, talk about uh, what we're expecting going forward and um, ideally to talk about um, how we can make things better uh, going forward. Um, so my most important role today here as the moderator of this session is going to be to make sure that uh, this uh, conversation remains as collaborative and constructive as possible. So I'm sure everyone will be on their best behavior as they search out for where their different transportation pieces are that they need during the course of the session. Um, just start with a bit of context here. In the winter of 2014, Canada experienced a severe lack of rail capacity uh, that led to many challenges for the supply chain. Um, and on March 6th this year, um, Canada's Ministers of Transportation and Agriculture um, took the unique step, this doesn't happen very often, um, of writing to the CEOs of CN and CP to, uh, and these are their words, these are the Minister's words, not my words, uh, express their serious concerns with respect to the railway's failure to meet the expectation, uh, expectations of shippers and customers over the course of the winter. Um, so we'll hear from, from the three different speakers. Um, there's a couple of questions that I will uh, just give right up front um, with a view to hearing from the speakers on um, uh, if, they, if they care to respond to those uh, questions. Perhaps they're the same uh, questions that you have in mind coming to the session this afternoon. So um, first question is how, how could this happen uh, now twice in a, in a four year period um, given the current situation we're in? Um, how long is it expected to fix the current situation? Um, what are the railway companies uh, doing to make sure that ideally this, uh, would ne this type of thing would never happen again? Um, and then lastly, for uh, Pierre from Transport Robert specifically, um, can you tell us what your industry is doing to help resolve the truck driver shortage and um, how is the regulations related to the uh, e-log books affecting uh, the industry? So uh, we're going to invite Pierre to come up and speak first. A little bit of intro here on Pierre Lapointe. Uh, he's a vice president at uh, Group Robert. Uh, he's got 30 years of experience in operations management and supply chain management. He has a very good knowledge of the distribution uh, sector, mainly in terms of fleet management and budgets and optimization. Uh, he's recognized for having a strategic vision and good ability to solve problems in complex situations. Uh, he's also, he also has a great ability to negotiate with different stakeholders. Mr. Lapointe uh, joined Group Robert in 2012 and previously worked for companies such as ConAgra Foods, Sucre Lantic and Sani Max. Pierre, over to you, please. Well, thank you. Um, probably you already know Group Robert. So we got two, a couple of slides just to present uh, our our company. Um, we are probably the second largest carrier in the east of the country. Um, more and we're housing transportation and uh, uh, and um, different kind of transportation, uh, specialized transportation and uh, uh, 3PL also. So that's what we are. We are over 300, uh, 300, uh, uh, 3,500 uh, person working for Robert, mostly uh, based in the east of the country and also north of uh, the U.S. <clears throat> Our main uh, customers for uh, the wood industries are just on the slide that you uh, you are having now, um, and um, I just put a few. Uh, if I miss some, I'm sorry about it. And um, we are from them different solutions. Um, specialized division or business unit. As offering uh, different type of uh, equipment for 
mostly for uh, woods and uh, mining and uh, uh, metal industries. We also have a division uh, of bulk divisions and we are also uh, having a bulk warehousing facility. So that's mainly what we are. And we also have a oversized division that is carrying uh, big stuff. Uh, could be part of uh, uh, equipment for your facility that we are moving also. So uh, to answer the first question that uh, uh, has been uh, asked, um, what, we are, what we are doing to avoid the shortage of, of driver of capacity. Um, we, um, we are doing a lot, maybe not enough, but we're doing a lot. Um, we, we make, um, we are embedded with uh, the, the school drivers, that, so the, the, the school drivers are embedded to our facility in Boucherville. So every driver that is coming out from the school get a stage on, on, our, on our business and then we are able to offer a job right away. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is uh, we are going to immigration right now. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be in France to uh, bring French driver here, uh, and we need to take care of, of them for at least a year. Is that the ultimate solution? Is it's going to resolve everything? I don't think so. And other things for sure that you probably will be able to help us it's the faster that we are leaving your facility or arriving or uh, leaving your facility when we are delivering or picking up a load, that's going to increase the capacity of the all to, to uh, make loads at the end of the week. So that could be a portion that uh, is belong your side, not on our side. We are asking if we can sleep over your facility to reduce times of lost times and everything. So that, that's things that you are doing right now. Uh, the schools are not empty, but not full as uh, we like. And that's the reason why some, sometimes they, they skip a, a session because there's not enough students to, uh, to fulfill the, the session. So that's, that's the reason. Uh, the other things is, Probably in near future, uh, we hope that we can get equipment that's going to be self-driving. We're not uh, we're not there yet, but you know what? I think the, within four to five years, we're going to start to see those uh, those equipment running on the 401. That could be another uh, solution to uh, avoid this uh, shortage. Yeah, uh, the, the e-log that is coming, I would say, within probably 18 to 20 months um, in our country will also get a big impact because we do have the experience of the U.S. side that we just made on the starting of the new year. Um, it caused likely at the beginning almost 40% of shortage in the U.S which is a lot. A lot of pressure of the rate. I know that some of you uh, are uh, facing to new rates right now, which is a, a, a big increase. Uh, we, we think that we're going to be faced in the same situation here. But because we do have experience of US, it must be a little bit, uh, it must have a little bit less impact over here. That's going to depend on the market. The market is very good right now. The, the business is good for everybody over here. So that's putting other uh, pressure on, 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 the, on the transportation side. And we'll see down the road in 20, 20, 20 months if the market is still strong. If the market is still strong as it is right now, uh, of course, we, we, will do, uh, we will be faced to a big uh, problem for sure. I don't, I don't have any solution for you guys and say, you know what, I've got a solution for you. This is, this is exactly what we're going to do. We are, um, we are meeting on a month basis right now to find solution to increase our capacity. 
because we, you're all our partners and we want to keep you as a partner. In, in the meantime, capacity is a big issue right now. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Pierre. I noticed the, um, uh, the link um, between the um, opportunity on immigration. You talked about going to France to, you know, the idea of some bringing some drivers from there over here. And I think this links back into one of the key messages from our keynote at the luncheon today is that we have to think a lot more about immigration uh, as a possible solution. So I just wanted to connect the dots there because I think that's a point uh, worth uh, underlining. Um, so our next speaker uh, is from CN. Uh, Thierry Lisiak is a 31-year uh, veteran at CN and he's held uh, various positions in uh, intermodal operations as well as sales and marketing. Uh, over the past 17 years, he's focused on sales and marketing functions within intermodal petroleum and chemical products, uh, metals and minerals, and uh, more recently forest products, which of course are the most important products moving in supply chain in Canada. Uh, currently he manages all the marketing aspects for CN's network uh, pertaining to forest products segment. Uh, welcome to you. Mais d'abord, j'aimerais remercier Joel et Swen de nous inviter uh, particulièrement à CN pour qu'on puisse vous présenter notre plan pour pouvoir suffire à la demande croissante et, pour être franc, n'était pas expecté non plus. Alors, euh, je vais profiter justement pour répondre aux questions que tu nous avais et en même temps, euh, vous montrer notre plan. En passant, j'ai pris la peine de prendre la photo qui nous montrait euh, un train qui passait à travers un banc de neige parce que j'ai vraiment l'impression qu'on est en train de sortir de notre hiver qui est une des causes euh, du problème qu'on avait présentement. So, alors, si on, if we go back in time, what we call it as a perfect storm, and to your question, what you were mentioning, what happened in 2014, what happened in 2018, uh, just for the record, 15, 16, 17, we basically didn't have a lot of winter, and uh, business went well, the, the forecast was good, the volume in 2015, 2016 were relatively uh, stable, which basically was a, a non-issue. 2014 was pretty particular. First, it was the worst winter, I think, in the century. And we also had, at the same time, a, a record crop of a, in the range of 77 million metric ton that we were mandated to move, absolutely. And uh, so that, that created a lot of pressure because moving the grain car obviously had forced us to use our resources to move that specific traffic. And it was so big that it was creating congestion in our network because we were moving the car, but sometimes the other partner of the supply chain, in, including the port, were not able to unload them. So we're creating a shortage of car on that side and you know, it had a ripple effect across our network. Now we're coming into 20, end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Um, We've moved in 2017 versus 2016, 11% more RTMs, which in the railway uh, discussion is a revenue ton mile, which is pretty amazing, especially when you consider that our target was in the high single digit, so we overpassed that. Um, we've seen uh, towards the third quarter of 2017 an increase across the board of all our segments that you can think about. Grain, that by the way is gonna have a close to another record uh, crop this year about 71 million uh, metric tons. Uh, Fraxan that we've seen triple digit demand. Okay, we, we're not able to move all that business, but the demand grew in a triple digit. We had a um, coal mine that came back alive, adding 8 million ton of demand of moving coal at, uh, across our network. And obviously, we plan a growth over 2017 for 2018, but never in that in that range, so it's really hard. We didn't have that latent capacity available to move 10, 20% more than what we could. Actually, we have certain pocket or network that we've seen a growth in the range of 20%. Um, and on top of what we've seen towards the end of last year, we saw a lot of disruption on our network from derailment due to weather-related uh, derailment we had incident on a crossing. We had trains stuck in avalanches, avalanche, um, which again, as soon as the train stop, we have one track. It kind of stop everything behind it and creates that ripple effect again. January, February, uh, for most of us in Quebec, I think we haven't really seen the impact of the winter, but 
from between January and February, 75% of the days during those two months were hit the, the, the railway threshold, which is minus 25 degrees. At minus 25 degrees, we cannot run our regular 10 to 12,000 feet train. At minus 25, the air becomes more denser, so the compressor in the locomotive cannot push the air into the braking system to release the brakes so the, can, can, the train can leave. So that, what that means, then we're starting to work into what we call tier restriction. There's tier one, tier two, tier three. Each tier, you basically take 20% out of train capacity. So that means the 20% stays in the yard behind because the train can only leave 80% of the 10 or 12,000 feet. And that creates, again, more cars in the yard, operation, our operation people have, to have difficulties of moving cars within the yard, building train, but more importantly, we need another crew and we need more locomotive to move that traffic. And for most of January, February, we were in tier three, which basically moving just above 50% of the regular train length. So that, not to make excuse, just to put a context of what happened. So what, what are we doing? I, so CN, like any railroads, is a very high capital uh, investment kind of company. And as you can see in 2014, is the first year where following the hard wind term, we say we don't want to be in this position again, started to increase our capital envelope for around $2 billion a year to $2.7 million. And despite the fact that in 2016 and 2017, uh, just 2015, 16, and the beginning of 2017, the volume didn't grow or the volume expectation was not to grow in a significant way, we kept investing that kind of money. Now we're hitting 2018, so as of last year, we're in Q3, we saw all that new business coming at us in a, in a significant fashion. We, we upgrade our expenditure to $3.2 billion that all is gonna be spent this year. So in the next couple of slides, what I'll do, I'll just go over what is pertaining to rail movement, because I think this is what all of us are interested to hear about. So the first thing is really hiring and training new train conductor. In 2017, we hired 3,500 people across different function and department, but in particularly in Q4, we had 265 uh, new train conductor that were put on, uh, on place, in, uh, in, especially in Western Canada, because this is where we've seen the most congestion and the most increase of demand. In Q1 this year, we're gonna, uh, two weeks from now, the target is 400, and we're pretty much there, and we're expecting another three to 400 uh, train conductor specifically going to become to, towards Q2 uh, of this year. So a lot of people ready to train, to ride train. On top of that, what we've done also, we have management riding trains. Some of your account managers are actually riding trains right now, in the, especially in Western Canada, again, to make sure that it, it moves. Uh, we, you, the union was extremely participative. They, uh, they agreed to move people from one location to another one, which normally is kind of a closed guard thing because they prefer to increase the number of members into each region. But knowing the important and the critical situation, they agreed to move people around. And we also finally uh, added and recalled some people that uh, some conduct, qualified conductor that were actually on retirement and they, they willingly come back and try to help the railway to move all that huge traffic that was bringing up to us. Pretty impressive result, all those new conductors, especially when you consider that it takes between six and nine months to recruit conductors and to train them. Keep in mind that even once they're trained, they're not as efficient as a veteran. Uh, it's gonna take them a little while. They know how to operate a train safely, but they still need to learn the different region that they're working on and they need to improve productivity. But again, we're very confident that we have what we need here. And lastly, on the training and hiring side, um, like a lot of you guys that have a mill uh, in a remote location, it's not always easy to find people that wants to work for the railroad, which uh, is not considered as premium kind of work for especially our millenniums who are working at night, weekend, evening, outside in the cold and minus, minus 25, minus 30. So our HR team did a terrific job to be able to bring all these people in. The second aspect is really, now we have the people, then we need power to be able to move the traffic. So 
What we've done last year, we acquired 284 new locomotives that were all uh, in function in Q4. We also took a short-term lease of 130 locomotives coming from the southern U.S. We found them, so we secured them right away, brought us on our network. And I think all of the 130 are running right now on our network. Uh, unfortunately, we had to put them through the shop because, again, minus 25, minus 30 didn't seem to fit very well with those uh, older locomotives that they're used to run at plus 40 degrees. Uh, so we had to shut them, but now they're all running. Uh, because one thing that is very important is we don't want a locomotive failure on our network because, again, creating delay, having to rescue the crew, and things you're trying to avoid. But keeping that in mind, we're saying the growth is there to continue, so what are we doing? We decided to put the, I think, the largest order uh, since 2012 or 14. We ordered 200 brand new locomotive. 60 of them are going to come towards age two of this year, because don't, keep in mind again, it's, it takes about 12 months to get, oh, I need to go a little faster. So more locomotives. And finally, now we need to make sure that the trains and the crew can actually run on a network. So as I, for the third year in a row, we're gonna spend $1.6 million on infrastructure maintenance and support to make sure that our railway is safe. But on top of that, we added a $250 million, $250 million special capital envelope, uh, specially designed to adding longer siding and double tracking in the, in the region where we have a more density of train. And the basic reason for that is when you have a train coming in at 12,000 feet in regular to operational circumstances, and there's only one track that can hold 12,000, they have to go aside and sometimes wait two, three, four hours for the other 12,000 train coming the other way around pass by. So by adding those 12,000 along the way, you can continue to run and wait at the last minute, then you push aside and then you keep going. And double tracking, but then it's easy just moving along. And I just added a little map to see where are the current pinch point that we're gonna work. So all that capital work is gonna be done this, this uh, summer. So yes, we're expecting a little slower velocity during the summer, but uh, all our engineering team are very confident by the beginning of Q4 this year, uh, we're gonna be able to put all the plan in place, and then we're gonna be in a very good shape to run for the next two, three years with the expected demand again. So just to conclude, our performance has continued to improve and will continue to improve. I was mentioning to a few people today that uh, I was looking at the stats, especially on the lumber side, uh, the two best days in the last two months in terms of volume and revenue, so pretty happy with that. But even more importantly, I was looking at our Velocity morning report, and there's a lot of green on there. Normally green, yellow, green is your 90% plus, or green, sorry, your 100% plus of your tar Velocity target. Yellow is when you're 90 to 100, and Pink is lower than 90, and there was very, very little pink on that sheet, which is, to me, it's given me the confidence that we're slowly coming out of the wood. All the effort we've done is going in the right direction. We're going to have incrementally better service, better car supply, because the issue that we're facing right now is really not car supply, is really to move the cars on our network. Because we plan for cars, that's part of one of my role. And I'm still confident that we had the exact amount of car to what we needed to move the traffic, especially on the forest product side. And uh, anyway, we're very confident that uh, we're doing the right thing and things are moving forward. We are confident about the North American economy. This is why we're spending so much money, $3.2 billion this year. And we want to make sure that our customer can grow and move their business the way they, they expect us to do it. And, Frankly, being on marketing and sales, I have the exact same goal. I want to move every single car that will be offered to me. That's it for it. Merci, Thierry. Um, so our last speaker as part of this panel is uh, from CP, uh, Maria Sara Siotis. Ah. <laughs> Hanging out with my uh, buddy Dimitrio Stephanopoulos is paying off from us, for myself. Um, she is the director of sales uh, and uh, for merchandise, uh, a role she was selected for in January 2017. Prior to this role, Maria was the director of intermodal and automotive customer service and CP logistics. Maria has responsibility for the merchandise portfolio for sales, which consists of forest products, mines, metals, aggregates, and food and consumer products. 
Maria started with CP in July 1999, and over the years, Maria has worked in sales and marketing and automotive and intermodal, as well as leadership roles in service delivery and customer service. Maria, over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I, I have been with the company for 19 years, and I have responsibility for the merchandise portfolio, and a big part of that is the Forest Products Group, and it's, it's really important to our portfolio. I'm really excited to be with CP, and we have a lot of good things going. We're a very strong, well-run, customer-focused, and disciplined organization. I'm going to take a few minutes right now to talk to you about what we're doing and how we're getting ready to provide great service to our valued customers and to help you succeed in your supply chain. Just a couple of slides here from a, from a statement perspective. Some of the statements are making are forward-facing forward and based on assumptions and uncertainties, and some of it in reality may, may differ. So, um, And any sort of dollar values will be stated in Canadian dollars. Today, more than ever, sustainable development is integral to our pursuit of long-term value creation and our commitment to being a responsible operator. Our railway's success is founded on our commitment to safety, efficient asset utilization, providing service, controlling our costs, and developing our people. These foundations allow us to run one of the best performing railways in North America, while leading the industry in the last 12 consecutive years in safety. Major trends. What we're noticing from a trend perspective, we're seeing strong demand, transportation capacity constraints and congestion, and the tightening of the truck market as well. What we're seeing from our shippers and what our shippers are expecting of us are scalable, reliable, low-cost supply chains. We at CP will play an integral and an increasingly important role in the supply chain of our customers. And I'm just going to go through a couple of slides to show you what we've done and where we're heading. From an operating perspective, we've made significant improvements over the last five years in our operations to create more capacity on our network. From an average train speed perspective, you can see over the last five years, we've had 23% improvement. Terminal dwell in hours, 7% improvement over the last five years, as well as fuel efficiency, 8% improvement, and our average train lengths over the, five, over the last five years have improved by 10%. All of our improvements in operating metrics have never come at the expense of our safety. As mentioned earlier, we are very proud to be the number one railroad and industry leader in safety in the last 12 consecutive years. So reinvesting in the business is the first call on cash. We have earmarked between 1.35 to 1.5 billion in capital investment this year that will further improve the flow of goods within North America. Ongoing investments in replacing assets, ensuring that, in, in, sorry, in replacing depleted assets will ensure the long-term sustainability of our business. We're going to have network upgrades like new tracks and longer sidings, which, which will drive further improvements and efficiencies in capacity. There's also rolling stock improvements in terms of locomotive modernization programs. What's next? As I mentioned in, the, in our operating side, a lot of the heavy lifting has already been completed. As we move forward, we will continue to operate extremely well. We will focus on sustainable, profitable growth, growth with our customers. We will remain very disciplined in our approach to growth. We'll continue to reinvest in our network, we'll improve throughput and capacity, and we'll continue to provide our customers with a better service offering. So our network, and this is our Forest Products Network, we have a strong franchise with a diverse reach. We operate over 12,400 miles from the Port of Vancouver to here in Montreal to Chicago and all the way south to Kansas City. We have connections to all the Class 1 railroads in many multiple locations and have numerous regional and short-line railway partners. And through these connections, the reach of our network continues to flow across North America. As you'll see on the, on the network map, we've put a lot of dots on the map in terms of transload locations. And what this does for you as a shipper is it gives you options. We might not directly serve your mill, but we're going to create transload locations in, in unique areas across British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and I'll further go into some of the east as well, which will give you options as a shipper to look at CP Rail and how we can provide value in your supply chain. On the, on the western side of Canada, we have the shortest route from the prairies and the Midwest to the Vancouver area. 
And we also operate the shortest route between Vancouver and Chicago. In the east, for Eastern Canadian shippers, we have direct transloads in Quebec City, Montreal, Sudbury, Hamilton, and Vermilion Bay. We can offer CP direct access to Northeast US. As a shipper, you can, you can ship directly with CP as a direct route to New York, Long Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. You can also look at those options in the Midwest where we offer to CP direct routing to St. Paul and Iowa. We want to work with our customers to focus on areas where we can do CP direct moves, where we can control that asset within our network and provide you the service efficiency and the velocity on our own network. One of the really exciting things that we did last year in the Vancouver area is in the summer of 2017, we opened up our doors to our new warehouse and transload facility in Vancouver. This is a unique proposition for all shippers because we provide direct port access on rail. We are taking trucks off the road. We're delivering containers to the port directly on rail. Trucks off the road, avoiding traffic and congestion, and you don't have the requirement of booking reservations or appointments with the port or getting any gate fees. Most importantly, what we did was we eliminated a last mile switch with any other railroad. We're controlling our own business. We're able to, on a cycle time, what we did on that, any customers that shipping into that CP Vancouver location, we saved anywhere between five and a half to seven days on cycle time. That's a significant improvement overall for all our shippers. This facility is poised for growth. There's a lot of room, warehouse space, center beam offloading capacity, dock doors, et cetera. There's, there's, a, there's tremendous opportunity that we'd like to talk to our shippers about. And in the east, we've opened up our new Montreal Transload facility. Again, giving eastern shippers more options for shipping on rail. We have a very strong partnership with a Quebec-based company who is operating our Transload in TYT. We have strate strategically positioned movements for Northeast US. We provide competitive service, reliable service, and we are giving you an option in your supply chain. We can accommodate a variety of car types, specifically center beams, bulkheads, gondolas, and flat decks. And the facility has really easy access to highway as well. I wanna thank you for taking the time today to listen to our session. I really encourage you to come by our booth today and speak to our team. We're very excited to talk to you about the supply chain. We can support your supply chain needs. We are ready to grow shareholder value, ready to provide service to all our valued customers, and ready to invest in the communities that we work in. Thank you.